In case you're wondering what is behind me, this is the Eta Carina Nebula. It's from uh, the, a, con a constellation um, uh, Carina in the Southern Hemisphere, which we don't see here um, from this far north. Uh, so I've never personally seen this, but uh, it's got some beautiful, beautiful stars in it, some beautiful constellations. All right, so I've got 731, I'd like to get started. Um, welcome to the MSU St. Andrews uh, STEM Center. My name is Edmund Stark. I, am, uh, a, uh, I have a degree in chemistry, so the um, Dr. Edmund Stark, my, I'm an assistant professor in chemistry, not astronomy, but I'm going to do my best to entertain you for the next uh, hour or so. Um, and I'm standing in front of an uh, actual backdrop. This is not a computer-generated backdrop. Um, of a nebula in the southern hemisphere. Tonight we will do um, multiple planets in April and May. It's a good time to watch the planets. We have some conjunctions and the focus will be the sun. The sun, how it moves in our sky and what it looks like from space. So let's get started. Um, the agenda for, we have these about once a month and the agenda is always the same. Starts out with a little homework from last month's slideshow. In other words, what I asked people to see. What's out in the sky tonight uh, and this month? The focus of the evening and then a modern astronomy highlight, which tonight is the Parker probe, which also has to do with the sun. So it all fits in. The homework for March's presentation. Um, has anyone who was out there last March with us have you been watching Venus in the evening? Had a beautiful conjunction with a star cluster, but it's been the brightest thing in the sky for a couple of months. Um, did you get up in the morning to see Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars? Um, it was very fun. They were actually in this order, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars at the start of uh, March, or at the start of April. But during that period, Mars passed by Jupiter and passed by Saturn. So there were these two conjunctions here. Um, I don't know if anyone happened to take a look at a star I pointed out called Betelgeuse, which is unusually dim, and uh, we'll talk about that again tonight. And this is a graphic I always show. Just read the headline. Without looking at the data, 18% chance of clear skies in Midland. If the skies are clear, go out and look, because you may not see the, the stars for another week. So this month. All five planets will be visible. It's a great time to do astronomy. And the five planets we're talking about are the ones that have been known since ancient times. Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They're all visible to the unaided eye. That comes as a surprise to some people. But the bottom line is if they were discovered in ancient history and the telescope has only been around for 400 years, obviously they're easy to see. They look like very bright stars, but they move against the constellations. So the highlight for tonight is Venus. Um, it's in the evening sky after sunset. Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn are still in the morning. And I'll give you a few more details. Here's a good view of the April, May evening sky. Uh, next week, May 5th, okay? You have that green line is called the ecliptic. It's where the sun moves. I'll talk about that later in the presentation but we have Venus right here. It's the brightest thing in the Western sky. If you look to the West and you see one thing, it will be Venus. It's been there for two months. It has been slowly moving up this way relative to the stars. Its peak brilliance is tonight, April 28th. How cool is that? But in May, it'll be diving back down into the sun and it'll be gone. And in July, by July, it'll be a morning star. This is the best evening show for Venus for many years. So don't miss it. Peak is right now. And one thing else I want to talk about, if you were to look at Venus in a telescope right now, if you were to look at it in a telescope about a month ago, you would have seen a little half moon. Since Venus passes between us and the sun, it has phases just like the moon. Now it looks more like a much larger crescent because it's getting closer and closer to us. So it gets bigger and brighter. And this isn't new. This was actually seen by Galileo way back in 1610. 
So the phases of Venus are something even the beginning telescope can see. Later in May, you can see Mercury and Venus, I'm gonna move my cursor out of the way, Mercury and Venus are both low in the south, in the, in the um, west. Venus will drop down, but Mercury will start to come up and will pass Venus. So as I've got it shown there on the 21st, they will be in conjunction, really close to one another. Mercury will continue to rise and put on a good show in June. It'll be very bright, but it's always close to the sun, so it can be hard to see. As I said, Venus will enter the morning sky in June, and that will be amazing. Why? Because right now, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are already in the morning sky. This shows what, what it'll look like in early May, and I also have the moon slowly going past them. Um, during the month, Mars will slowly move this way away from Saturn and Jupiter. And during the course of the year, Jupiter will slowly move towards Saturn. So looking forward a little bit to the next month, um, Venus will join them. It'll be way down here, um, but you'll be able to see it and it'll come up. But Jupiter will pass Saturn in December. This only happens once every 20 years. So put it on your calendar. And here's the interesting thing I wanted to talk about. Here is, I think you can see the constellation of Orion, the hunter, the three belt stars. Most people know that. And there's a bright shoulder star called Betelgeuse. You can see it's about as bright as the opposite star in the skirt, which is called Rigel. And it's significantly brighter than the eye of the bull in Taurus, which is called Aldebaran. This is how it's been for my lifetime. Here is a image taken last December and you can see Betelgeuse is clearly dimmer than Rigel. It's even dimmer than Aldebaran. This happened unexpectedly. It's been going on for three months and nobody knows why. So if you wanna see something which might be a once in a lifetime event, check out Orion and check out how faint that red star Betelgeuse is compared to what it normally is. And I usually have some handouts that I give out when we're, when we're um, in person. I can hand those out or send them out electronically. Here you can see again, here is Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion. It's getting close to the west. Late at night, it will already have set. And you will want to compare Betelgeuse to the brightness of these other three stars, Aldebaran, um, Castor and Pollux up in Gemini, and Rydal, which I've already shown his set. So tonight's agenda um, looks like half of it is already done and we're not even 10 minutes in. But now we're gonna start our main focus. We're gonna focus on the sun. And I'll break that down a little bit more. I want to talk a little bit about the ancient understanding and early scientific research into the sun. And I'm talking BC type research as well, because that's the kind of stuff that you can do by yourself. You can go out and see it. And that's, I think that's what real science is. Real science is not watching television and being fed all sorts of information. Real science is getting out, looking at stuff and getting excited about what you see. So I'm going to talk about the sun's movement in the sky. And I'm going to talk about how people first discovered how big and how far away the sun is and how much energy it actually gives out. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that energy, um, about how, let's say, the atomic structure, the density of the system, the electric repulsion is trying to keep the star at bay. Gravity is trying to crush it into a hole and fusion is trying to blow it apart. And we're going to look at all those forces. And then we'll talk a little bit about what the sun looks like. We have a lot of good photos, some structure in the interior and some structure that we can see on the outside. And again, our technology highlight is the Parker probe. So what does the sun do in the sky? Well, it moves, of course, but how and where in the sky? There's the daily motion that we all know. It rises in the east, goes through the south, and sets in the west. This is for the northern hemisphere. But every day is different. Now we're heading towards summer. We're about here. 
and the sun rises here. But as we get further into June, it rises more and more to the northeast, goes very high in the sky, and rises and sets, I'm sorry, in the northwest. Then you have a very short night. But later on in the winter, as we get towards the December solstice, it rises not in the east, but in the southeast, goes just a little bit into the sky and sets in the southwest, and then we have a very long night. So the sun is all over the place here in the sky. Now it's never here, it's never in the north, but there's a huge section in the sky relative to the horizon and to north, south, east, and west. But how does the sun move relative to the stars, relative to the constellations? That is completely different. I'm going to talk a little bit about this line here. The fixed stars form constellations. We call them fixed stars. Now, the stars are all around us, 360 degrees, so to speak. That means they're present in the daytime as well. It's just that the sky is so bright because of the sun, you can't see them. In fact, the sun is moving across constellations. And this line here, out of all that, what we saw in the previous slide about how it's all over the place when you compare it to the horizon, when you look at the constellations, it moves in one clean line. It's never over here. It's never in, let's say, here's the Big Dipper. It's never in the Big Dipper. Here's Orion. It's never in Orion. It passes through Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and you might guess the rest. Goes through Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, um, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, and then a year later, back towards Taurus again. The sun follows a single line in the sky, and that line is called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic passes through the zodiac or the zodiac constellations. So here they are along with their dates. All right. So if you are, so if you are born, um, let's say if today is your birthday, um, we can see that you would be born in uh, Taurus. But there are problems with this. First, these times are all the same. They don't match reality. Look at this tiny little bit of time the sun passes through Cancer. And then look at this huge amount of time it spends in Virgo. If astrology had some reality, there would be three times as many Virgo people as there are Cancers. But they're actually given the same, um, everyone's given a month. So that's not astronomically correct. But the other problem is the dates don't match the sun. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, um, the sun should be in Taurus, but the sun is now in Aries, not in Taurus. It won't enter Taurus until mid-May, which means for me, for example, um, my sign is Cancer. I was born in late June, but the sun was actually in Gemini when I was born, so it has no bearing. Um, plus, there's one more thing. There's a constellation called Ophiuchus that the sun passes through for several weeks in December, and for some reason, that's not in the zodiac. So there's a lot of problems with astrology, which is why I am interested in astronomy and not astrology. But how else is the sun different? Well, obviously, the stars are points of light. The planets look like points of light. I'm talking about what you see without a telescope. The sun and moon are different. They're clearly disks. How do they compare? Now, okay, I said the sun is a disk, but don't look at the sun. I'm going to emphasize that throughout the, throughout the um presentation. Here's an image. You may not know that the, sun, that the earth gets closer and further from the sun, and the moon gets closer and further from the earth as it goes in its orbit. When the moon is closest at perigee, it looks very large, and when it's further at apogee, it looks small. When the, moon, when the sun is closer at perihelion, it's still smaller than the moon. When it's smallest, when it's further from us at aphelion, it's larger than the moon. So, but these are really close to the same size. It's about half a degree. So what's a degree? You remember in a protractor, 360 degrees in a circle, 90 degrees in a right angle. Each division here is one degree, and the moon is only half a degree across. It looks like it's bigger, 
but it's about half a degree. Um, each degree is divided into minutes, just like each hour is divided into minutes. It's all from the Babylonians. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but we actually use the Babylonian system, which is about 3,000 years old, 3,500 years old. The sun is about 32 minutes. The moon is about 33 minutes of arc. Both are just a little bit more than half a degree. But what about actual size and distance? And we're more concerned with the sun, even though this slide that I pulled off or this image I pulled off has the moon. For small angles, size is proportional to the distance. So if I see something that's this big, if it's twice as far away, it has to be twice as large to just be that size. So we need to know either the actual distance or the actual size, and we can calculate the other. But for purposes of us right now, one thing we can answer is which is closer, the sun or the moon, just based, just based on going outside and taking a look. And there's one way you can tell, and that way is in a solar eclipse, why does that happen? It happens because the moon passes between the sun and the earth. So the moon must be closer. So the sun must be larger because it's further away. But how do we get more than that? We're going to go way back in history to Adristarchos Hosamos, and he did this 250 years before Christ. He was the first to claim that the sun is at the center of the universe, the first to put the planets in the correct order. But I'm only going to talk about his work on the distance to the sun. He was very clever about this. He knew that when the moon is full, it has to be on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. When the moon is what we'll call first or last quarter, when it looks like a half moon, we're seeing it half lit, then this has to be a 90 degree angle, a right angle. Based on what Greeks knew about math, if we could measure the angle then from the moon, earth to the sun, if we could measure this angle, we could calculate how far the sun was relative to how far the moon was. So he did that and he measured 87 degrees, which is low, but that's what he came up with. That implies that the sun is at least 20 times as far as the moon. This was astounding at the time, that there's this huge difference in distance. And in actuality, it's about 400 times further. Now, many people have been studying this. The next one I want to talk, to, talk about is Hipparchus of Nikaya. And he was an incredible man. He, let's just say he discovered and documented many things that most people don't even know happen. Um, and this precession of the equinoxes, for example, is why astrology is off. But I'm just gonna talk about the sizes and distances of the sun and the moon. And how did he do it? He did it by something called parallax. And if you've never looked at parallax, we're gonna do that right now. You can see parallax with your thumb. I want you to just look at an object across the room, let's say the wall, a painting on the wall or something. Close your left eye and line up your thumb right with it like I'm lining up the camera. Now close your right eye and open your left eye and go blinking back and forth and it will look like your thumb is moving. Now your thumb hasn't moved, it's simply your vantage point has moved a couple inches and that's made your thumb apparently move. If you know the distance between your eyes, you can calculate the distance of your thumb from that type of measurement, that's parallax. And he did that with the moon. Looking at the, the moon from two different places at the same time, you should be able to see it against two in two different places against the background stars. So can you really do that? It sounds kind of complicated. And here's a big problem. How do you know when you don't have any clocks and you have no way of communicating, how do you know that you're doing something, that you and your partner who is in another country are observing at the same time? Well, the first one, we can do that by eye. This is a uh, computer simulation of the position the moon would be if you looked at it from the North Pole, from the South Pole, East Horizon and West Horizon based on the background stars. It moves several lunar diameters back and forth. So that's something you can measure. 
But what about knowing what time it is? You have to have some kind of universal synchronizing event. And I think you can guess where I'm going with this. This is a series of pictures that I took with a camera of the eclipse of uh, last winter, two winters ago, sorry. And a lunar eclipse has nothing to do with the Earth's rotation. It has nothing to do with time or latitude or longitude. Everybody who sees the eclipse sees it at exactly the same time. So now this, this is what Hipparchus did. And this presentation I'm giving is much oversimplified. He did a much more complex and beautiful job. He needed to use latitudes and the radius of the earth in order to determine where he and his partner were and how far apart they were. Now, where did he get the earth's radius? From a colleague named, well, a previous worker named Eratosthenes. He discovered the, or he calculated the circumference of the earth at 200 BC to be 24,500 miles. And the modern value is 24,800 miles. Wow. So in the middle ages, when people were thinking the earth is flat, 200 years before Christ, the Greeks, at least some of them, knew not only that it was round, but they knew exactly how big it was. Now, using those numbers and his parallax, he got the lunar distance was 60 times the radius of the earth, 240,000 miles, and he nailed it because we, it varies a little bit, but it goes between 225,000 to 253,000 miles. And that's right where his number is, pretty much spot on. And other Greeks used that number to get at the distance of the sun in the same way. And they also got a pretty good value. But it's not so easy. Um, and I'm going to talk now about more modern, 1600s. I'm calling that modern. So by that time, astronomers knew the order of the planets from the sun. They even knew the relative distances. By that, I, for example, they knew that Jupiter was about five times as far as the Earth from the sun, and that Saturn was twice as far as Jupiter. But they didn't know any absolute distances. They didn't know if it was a million miles or 10 million miles or 100 million miles. They knew these numbers for the moon, but the moon is so close it doesn't help them in this. So they needed to get the distance between Earth and any, st any planet. And then all the distances would fall into place. The first one to try this was Christian Huygen, is actually how that's pronounced, Christian Huygens, we say it. Um, he used the phases of Venus in the same way that Aristarchus used phases of the moon, and he got the correct value. But we don't normally look at his value because he basically guessed that Venus was about the same size of the Earth because he didn't have anything absolute either. And that guess turns out to be very correct, but he was just lucky. The person who got it with a more appropriate method was Domenico Cassini. He used parallax to determine the absolute distance to one of the planets, to Mars, when it was close. Um, he measured the parallax of Mars from Paris. He sent a colleague, Jean Richter, to French Guyana to do the same thing on the same day at the same time. By that time, they had clocks and calendars. So they could calculate the absolute distances. And this gave the distance to the sun only 7% short of today's value. And that's, oh, that's almost 400 years ago. That's amazing. Now, there's one more thing we want to talk about, and that's the mass of the sun, how much it weighs, so to speak. And for there, we talk about Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists of all time. Um, gravity, he invented the telescope, heat transfer, he invented calculus, all these things. So we are the St. Andrew's STEM Center. So there is science, technology, and engineering, and math. And if you want to make it the STEAM Center, adding in arts, there we have um, Newton's history as a theologian and in biblical chronology. But what we're interested in is his theory of gravity. With this equation and using Kepler laws of motion, he needed an estimate of this number. Um, and I'm not obviously going to go into everything. He tried a number of times because he, and he kept updating it because he kept getting better values. But his final value for the mass of the sun, 169,000 times the mass of the earth. He's only off by a factor of two. 
again, over 300 years ago, amazing. And this is just with very rudimentary telescopes, which are not as good as the ones you can go to the store and buy today. So I'm gonna summarize all this. The mass of the sun is 100, sorry, the diameter of the sun, 100 times the diameter of Earth. Its volume is a million times the volume of the Earth. Its mass is 300,000 times ours. The gravity at its surface is 28 times ours. Huge, incredible numbers. So I want to give you a, a sense of what this really means. So this is something everyone can do. Pretty much all of you have something like this, an Earth globe. And they're all about one foot across. Now, to, to scale, the moon would be about this large. I can have our 3D printing people print one out. But this is about the size of a baseball. If you were to put the Earth globe into the center of a typical house, let's say 50 by 30 square, 50 feet by 30 feet, you put this in the center, the orbit of the moon will cut the four corners of the house. That gives you a sense of how much space there is between the earth and, and the moon. The sun, however, if you were to put the sun where the earth is in your house, it would extend 50 feet in all directions. It would completely consume your home. So just so we're clear, yes, the entire orbit of the moon around the earth would fit inside the sun if you put the earth at the sun center. The earth, the, the sun is about twice the size of the orbit of the moon. It's an amazing thing. And if you had the earth at your home, the sun would be two miles away. Now, one thing on this table, Oh, one more thing I forgot. The biggest thing about the sun, not its size, it's not even what we might call its gravitational field, it's the heliosphere. The heliopause where that ends is 11 billion miles into space where the, I have described as magnetic field, it's basically the stream of particles that are coming off of the sun. It's three times farther than Pluto. So when you come into our solar system, you are aware of the presence of the sun before you're aware of planets, comets, or any of that other stuff. The sun is immense. And there's one thing over here I wanna call your attention to. Density, how much something weighs per volume. The density of water, if you have a cubic foot of water, it weighs about 62 pounds. Jupiter, being a gas giant, weighs more than water. And the sun, even though it's we call it a big blob of gas. It also weighs about, it's about the same density as Jupiter. So that begs the question, how can the density of a gas be greater than a liquid? That's gonna be important later on, but I just thought I'd toss that in here because we have the numbers. There's one more number I wanna give you, and that is the solar energy output. This is a colossal number. Um, the Earth receives about one and a third kilowatts every square meter from the sun, every square meter across the Earth. So that's therefore, and that's a tiny fraction of the sun's output because we're so far away from the sun. If you do the math, the total energy of the sun is three point, about four times 10 with 23 zeros after it. I don't know what to do with that number, but I'll try to put it into perspective. The energy of the sun is such that it gives off, remember the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima wiped out the entire city, the first atomic bomb? This is a hundred trillion Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every second. Another quote I found, if all the sunlight striking the earth's surface in Texas, only in Texas, could be converted into electricity, it would be 300 times the total power output of all the power plants in the world. Another option, every second, our sun produces enough energy for half a million years of our current needs of our, of our civilization. So absolutely incredible numbers. How are numbers like this possible? And if the sun is cranking out that much energy, what could possibly hold it together? So, um, 
this is a, I don't know if we have, um, if we have any um, questions. I forgot to mention something, I, and I apologize for this. Um, you can use the Q&A feature on your Zoom if you have any questions. And my co I have a colleague here, um, Nick Hinton, and he and I will try to go through the questions and answer them when we have a gap. And this is one of these, uh, this is one of these gaps. So uh, if you have anything you want to send my way, I'll pause for a minute. But um, I want to talk to at least this slide because this is a summary of what we've basically gone through. By about 1700, astronomers had measured and calculated the distance of the sun from the earth, the mass of the sun, the diameter of the sun, the gravitational force exerted by the sun, the total energy emitted by the sun, that came a little later. With all that information, they still had no idea about what the sun was and where its energy came from. That's what we're going to talk about next. And um, we're coming back to Newton. I mentioned all these amazing accomplishments. He has one more that we're going to look at. Theory of light and color, which were in his book called Optics. By Newton's time, people knew about prisms. They knew that they um, gave these like little sparkly colors. Um, but Newton did something different. People were reasonably assuming that the prism was causing the colors. What Newton showed is that white light, the prism isn't creating the colors. The colors are all in the light and that the prism is breaking it up into its component question, into its component colors. We later learned that there are far more colors given off by sunlight that we don't see. And here is a little graph of that. So what I've got here is the wavelength of the light. And I've got here the amount of energy that's given off by the sun. The blue line is the amount of energy given off by the sun. And the red line is the amount of energy that you'd expect for something that is glowing at about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 5,800 Kelvin. So that's how we know the temperature of the sun because it matches this theoretical output that was generated by Kirchhoff and that's kind of beyond the scope of the talk. This box here, as I've got indicated down here, is the visible light that we can see with the blue light on this side and the red light on this side. So this is how we know that the sun is 5,800 degrees Kelvin, which is a, um, it's about one and a half um, Fahrenheit degrees, 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees. But what do we do with that spectrum now that Newton, what Newton spread out the spectrum? Here's a man who really helped us, Josef Ritter von Fraunhofer. He was a physicist who improved the spectroscope, added in a grading. And when he looked at the spectrum, he noticed dark lines. Here is a postage stamp from Germany for the 200th anniversary of Fraunhofer's birth. And it shows his own illustration and with his own coloring of the spectrum where he saw these dark lines. He eventually, as he kept making improvements, he found over 500 of these lines. And we've already seen them. This is the same curve I showed you before. These little dips, in the sun's intensity, these are the Fraunhofer lines right here. Those are the Fraunhofer lines that we can actually see. Now we've continued to make improvements over the last few hundred years. There are 25,000 of these lines, okay? But what are they? <laughs> and why am I talking about them on, on this talk about the sun? Because they turn out to be very important. And they're important for these two guys. Gustav Robert Kirchhoff, uh, we, in English, he would be known as Robert Kirchhoff, and Robert Wilhelm Eberhard Bunsen. If you are into the sciences at all, you may recognize this is the Kirchhoff who developed the spectroscopy laws, the three laws of spectroscopy, and the laws of circuitry. Those are Kirchhoff's laws. And if you have heard Bunsen's name, as it's commonly pronounced in English, 
Yes, this is the man who invented the Bunsen burner. They collaborated in Heidelberg, and what they showed is that in 1859, they discovered that the some of the lines, those Fraunhofer lines, are due to the presence of metallic sodium in the sun. It's absorbing at certain frequencies. So they showed that the Fraunhofer lines are merely absorption lines of common elements that we have on Earth. So now we can answer that first question I asked in red, what is the sun made of? We just have to analyze the lines. Now it's not so simple, but that's where this all gets started. Here you will probably recognize the periodic table with all these elements in it. So what have we found for the composition of the sun? 70% of the sun is hydrogen, 77% by weight. One proton, one electron, the simplest possible element. 21% is helium, the next simple possible element. Both of these are light, ultra lightweight gases, at least at room temperature, at earth temperature. So if you do your math and you know that things have to add up to 100%, that means the entire rest of the table contributes only 2% of the elements in the sun. And most of those are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and neon. So what do we do with all that hydrogen and helium? Well, in 1920, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington proposed fusion, the conversion of hydrogen into helium as the energy source of the sun. If you take four grams of hydrogen gas and can convert it somehow to helium, you lose about a little bit less than a percent of the, that weight to energy. And that is a stupendous amount of energy, 600 million kilocalories of energy. If you were to burn the hydrogen, which is what we use for rocket fuel when we send up like the old Saturn V engines that took us to the moon, those incredibly powerful engines burned hydrogen with oxygen. This reaction, the fusion reaction, gives 4.6 million times the energy you would get from burning it with oxygen. And here's how that happens. I don't want to get too much into it, Two protons come together and collide. They spit off an interesting particle here, a positron and a neutrino. They form another atom, deuterium, another nucleus. Add another proton. They form um, helium-3. You do the same thing again, and two helium-3s collide. You get helium-4. This is the helium that, that I'm talking about that was in the periodic table, and you get two of your protons back. The net reaction is four protons give you Four hydrogen nuclei give you a helium nuclei, two positrons, two neutrinos, and a huge amount of energy. Now, what's a positron? It's an antimatter electron. Yes, the sun makes billions of tons of antimatter. What's a neutrino? It's a particle with a very tiny mass that passes through the entire Earth, usually, without it even interacting. Very mysterious, ghostly particle. But how does this happen? How do you get these things so close together? Um, because atoms can't, be, can't really be um, compressed. If you, have, you may remember, or you may not, atoms have positively charged nuclei, and they're surrounded by negatively charged electrons. This negative electron cloud keeps the nuclei apart because negative repels negative positives repel. It's true even as a solid. So here we're looking at a gas where the atoms are widely spread. Here we're looking at a solid where they're in a nice orderly array all touching. You cannot get more tight than that. So how do we get around this? How do we get the nuclei to fuse? Two reasons. One, most of the sun is too hot for normal neutral atoms to exist. The elements lose electrons and they become essentially an ionic gas. This is a plasma. You've heard of solid, liquid, and gas. A fourth state of matter, plasma, an ionized gas. Totally different properties. It's a gas that is completely opaque to light, and it's a gas that conducts electricity. Very different. But also very important is that so much of the sun is hydrogen, and hydrogen has only a single electron moving around a single proton. 
That means when hydrogen loses its electron, there's nothing left but a bare proton. So this plasma, and that's what I've tried to illustrate here, just the protons lying around with the electrons in a big cloud everywhere. This is very compressible. And how much space have we gained by stripping off that electron? I'll give you a feel for that. Atoms are mostly empty space. This is Spartan Stadium seats, 75,000 people. Imagine that Spartan Stadium is a hydrogen atom, one hydrogen atom. That's the size of the atom. If the atom were that large, then the nucleus, the proton, would be a P at its center. So you break apart that structure and the compression can truly, truly begin. And here's how much it begins. This is a plot of the density of the sun in its middle, in the core, all the way out to the surface. And this equation we had is very important because the distance between the things that are attracting is in the denominator. That means you cut the distance in half, gravity goes up by a factor of four. You cut that distance by 10, gravity goes up by 100. So the core is greatly compressed compared to the surface. The core is 10 times the density of gold at the, at the bottom, and it eventually becomes lighter than air. So very different from Earth. Now, when you pump up a soccer ball, if you pay close attention, if you, put, if you pressurize something, you heat it up. This pressurizing of the core makes the core also much hotter than the surface. This graph looks different, but it's, com but it's it rather looks the same, but it's a very different graph. The core of the sun is 15 million degrees at the center and comes all the way back down to about 6,000 at the surface. But you still need to bring two positive charges in contact. The, electros, the electric repulsion between those two protons is tremendous. And so you need these unbelievable pressures and temperatures. When you compress the hydrogen plasma, to make a long story short, you compress the density, it becomes the density of gold and there's 7 million degrees temperature. The fusion of hydrogen into helium occurs and this, it tries to blow the star apart. And the only thing holding it together is gravity. So here is a reasonable place if there are any, if any questions have come in. Uh, yes, actually, we have two questions. Excellent. Uh, the first is, how did they figure out the power output of the sun? Well, the power output of the sun, I tried to indicate that they basically measured how much power we receive on Earth. And again, if this is the Earth and the sun is two miles away, we measure per square meter how much energy we get. We do this in space, it's 1.3. We lose a lot of it. It's more like one kilowatt per square meter by the time we get to the surface. But if this is how much the Earth gets, we use geometry to calculate that assuming the sun is radiating in all directions, this entire four mile diameter sphere is all getting the same amount of energy as the earth is. So you just multiply it out and that's how you come up with that number. Okay. Second question? Yep, uh, the second question is, why do stars collapse when they fuse iron? I have a slide somewhere on that that I didn't want to, I didn't put in here because I think I'm going to have to talk about that later on. Stars want to explode when they're fusing hydrogen because it gives off so much energy, okay? It turns out that uh, you know that these hydrogen, helium, oxygen, these are all stable, but you also probably know that the really big elements at the bottom of the table are not stable. They fall apart by themselves. At some point, piling more and more nucleons into the center doesn't do you any good. In fact, it makes it unstable. Iron and nickel are at that point at the top of that curve where before you're making iron, every time you do fusion, energy 
is given off and it helps push the star apart. If you're going to start fusing iron, you're making something that on a per nucleon basis is actually less stable. So you can fuse iron without any problem, but it takes energy. It doesn't give out energy. And those large stars are desperate to give out energy to keep everything from collapsing. Once the, the mechanisms in the core are starting to use up energy, it's all over. It's like literally less than an hour and it's gone. But that's another talk, I hope. I hope to give that talk someday. Okay, and we actually do have one more question. Sure. Uh, will the sun end as a white dwarf or a nova? Well, um, we currently believe that the sun does not have enough mass to go in. Does that see, again, this, is a, this would be great for another talk about how stars die. Um, the sun will probably end up as a white dwarf. The only way the sun is likely to ever end up as a nova is if it comes across another star and it starts sucking um, uh, gas and hydrogen onto the white dwarf core, in which case you would have a, a type one supernova, um, different from what we're used to talking about. So it will probably end its life as a white dwarf unless it finds a companion. All right. so. Here, I've talked about the ancient understanding of the sun, how these forces balance. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what the sun actually looks like so that we can see some fun pictures. Um, and then of course the, the Parker solar probe. As these, or as these um, drawings or these uh, graphs show, I talked about the core, the radiative zone and the convective zone. Well, the sun is divided into three parts. There's the core. In here, the temperature and the pressure and the density are great enough for hydrogen to fuse into helium. All the energy is created there. Not at the surface of the sun, although it looks like a nuclear bomb going off, but the energy is created in the core. Now it has to get out. How does it get out? In this zone, the radiative zone, it's called that because the energy transfer of heat from the core on out is by radiation, photons bouncing around. Because it is so dense and so opaque to photons, it can take a million years for a photon created into the core to get through this zone. After it passes through here, it goes into the convective zone. The convective zone is called that because the energy transfer, the primary energy transfer is not by radiation, but by convection. What's convection? It's like hot air rising. If you imagine you light a flame under a hot air balloon and the balloon goes up because the air in the balloon is less dense and it rises. That's what's going on here. You've got hot spots that rise up and they transfer heat faster than radiation and they get to the top and they burst. And you can see this at the surface. So what does it look like? Let's take a look at the surface. All right, so again, let's take a look at the surface. Let's not take a look at the surface. Do not look directly at the sun. Permanent eye damage will result. Never point the telescope towards the sun. Um, some of you have probably started fires with magnifying glasses. Now imagine magnifying glass this big going into your eye. Enough said, you don't want to do this. But so how do we view the sun with a telescope? We use special solar filters that cover the entire front of the telescope. It looks like a sheet of aluminum. You can't even see through it. And there's one right there where that red arrow was pointing. And you can see it basically looks like an aluminum pan. Um, this image here is not as good as what you would see. I basically took a camera and held it over the eyepiece. Um, when you, it's not as good as what you would see with your eye, but it is good enough to see sunspots up here and the planet Mercury, where that little blue arrow is. This is a transit of Mercury, which happened um, in, 19, or sorry, in 2016, and I was out taking a picture of it. I'm showing this not because we're gonna have a transit of Mercury very soon, but because this gives you another image of how big the sun is compared to the rocky planets. Here's a more professional image of the sun. 
this is of the photosphere. This is what's commonly called the surface of the sun. This is what you could see with a properly filtered telescope on a good day. I've seen things that look just like this. So what do you see? You see this limb darkening. Um, this is not uh, a bad telescope, this is normal. You see this granular appearance. Um, it's not smoothly yellow. That's not pixelation, that's real. There are granules in the sun. But the most obvious thing are the sunspots. Some are small, like this one here, some are larger, some are very large, and some are humongous. This one is so large, you can see it has dark areas and light areas. It's called the umbra and the penumbra, just like for lunar eclipses. So let's zoom in on one of those. This is a great shot that you're not gonna get um, with your telescope. You need to be up above the atmosphere and in a vacuum tube, and it's a long story. But sunspot, for this particular sunspot, the Earth is about as large as this part right here. So these sunspots can be larger than the Earth. They're located where magnetic field lines enter or exit the photosphere. They're not, they look dark as though they're cold. They're not really cold. They're like almost 4,000 degrees. But when the rest of the sun is 6,000 degrees, they are cold in a relative sense. Look at these granules. They look like little grains of popcorn seeds, or um, I don't know what you want to call it. Remember I talked about the convection bubbles? These things, these convection bubbles where hot gases and plasma are rising from the interior, they're about one or 2,000 kilometers across, and they last for about five or 10 minutes, 15 minutes before they blow up or get absorbed by another one. Very dynamic. And that's one thing I also promised in the flyer, changes we can see in the sun. All right, now we can certainly see changes from where it moves, when it rises in northeast or rises in the southeast, okay? But we can see changes in the sun as well. Sunspots are where most of the action is because the granules are hard to see. Um, the sun rotates about once a month, a little faster near the equator, a little slower near the poles. Remember, it's not a solid body. So the equator is rotating faster than the poles and kind of tearing the sun around. So sunspots appear and they move across the surface. If you have two or three days of clear skies, you will see the sunspots move day by day. Sometimes you will see one rotate in from this horizon. Sometimes the sunspot will be over here, will be rotating out. They can change, the big ones will change in shape. The next day it will look different than it did the previous day if you make a careful drawing, which is a lot of fun to do. They can also change in shape and they can appear or disappear. But we don't always have sunspots. Look at this image. This little thing here qualifies as a sunspot and it's one of the very few sunspots I've seen all year. This image was from yesterday. First sunspot in a while. And in this year, out of 118 days so far in the year, 90 have had no sunspots. What's going on? There's a sunspot cycle. Let's take what I've got here in this chart is the number of sunspots people have reported. And here are the calendar years. So you can see that in 19, looks like in 19, um, 58, 59, there was a peak. And in 1965, there was a trough. And in 1976, there was a, a, a low amount. 1987, 1998, 2009, every 11 years apart. Here we are in 2012. We're after a low peak, and we are at a very, very low minimum. So now, how steady is this cycle? Sunspots were discovered by Galileo in 1609, when he first invented the telescope. So we have 400 years of observations, and they've been recorded. It's not science unless you write it down. And these were studied by Edward Walter Maunder at the Greenwich Observatory in Britain, and his wife, Annie Maunder. He discovered the butterfly effect, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And he also rediscovered and popularized the results of Gustav Sporer, who found a period of low sunspot count hundreds of years earlier. This is known as the Maunder minimum. 
and it coincides with a weather feature called the Little Ice Age. Let's look at some of the data. This is the butterfly effect. Every time when the sunspot st cycle starts, we'll say like right here when it starts from a trough, the sunspots appear high on the sun. This is the sun's equator, this is the North Pole, and this is the South Pole. The sunspots appear at mid-latitudes, and by the end of the cycle, they're down here in the trough. There are very few, and then they start coming up here again, cycle after cycle after cycle, the butterfly effect. Here is the 11-year cycle, year after year. You can see how consistent it is, like clockwork. And then we have this period here where there were virtually no sunspots reported, and bottom line is, Nobody understands why. So there's still a lot to discover in science. It's not all known. So all of that had to do with the photosphere, what we normally call the surface of the sun. I want to show you some uh, slides of the chromosphere. This is a layer just above the photosphere. It's fairly thin, 100 kilometers or so, um, which sounds pretty big, but on the scale of the sun, it's a thin layer. Um, it's actually hotter than the photosphere. And these are taken, these images are taken where they actually have things in common with the photosphere. These dots here are, these dark dots are sunspots and these white things around them are plages, brilliant hot spots that you don't see in the photosphere. You also have these dark filaments like this. These are something called prominences. Now I'll get to that in the next slide. Their prominence is viewed from above. Another feature you find, oh, I have a typo. I have corona images. These are not corona images, I apologize. These are images in the um, chromosphere. These little red, they look like little red triangles of flame. These are called spicules. These change, I don't want to say minute by minute, but if you're looking at spicules over the space of an hour, you will see them wiggle back and forth just like little fires. These are the interesting things, prominences. Here's a shot of the sun's limb. And you see these huge arcs of flaming gas going off. They look quite bright because they're against empty space. Here's the surface of the sun, but you can tell they're a little darker than this surface. But I chose this image because here is a prominence coming at us on the surface of the sun. And you can see it is darker because it's cooler. So these lines here are small, all these little filaments are small prominences right here again. They are small prominences that are on the surface of the sun, and so they look dark. Beyond the photosphere and the chromosphere is the corona. This is a big layer. It extends millions of miles beyond the surface. The corona is what people see during an eclipse, when the moon blocks out the photosphere and the chromosphere and allows you to see the much fainter corona. This is, if you ever go have a chance to see a total solar eclipse as opposed to a 95% eclipse, you see a total solar eclipse, you want to do it. I took this picture with a common point and shoot camera in the 2017 eclipse in Wyoming. This is what you actually see with your eye. You see something like this with all these lines coming away from the sun. It's absolutely amazing. And the particles are streaming off into space and the temperature of the corona is over a million degrees. Why does it keep getting hotter? We don't really know, but people are, as of like say 2015, 2018, a lot of results are coming out that involve magnetic lines heating this. And that's a little bit beyond the scope of the talk. But well, let's just say there's magnetic energy coming out all across the surface of the sun and it's putting energy into the corona, bypassing the intermediate layers. Here's another shot of the corona. This is done with a coronagraph. What it does is it's got a disc that creates an artificial eclipse. It basically blocks out the sun so that you can see this during the day. And I like this shot because here's these streams of ionized gas, these million degree hot plasma streams coming out. And you can still see, here's a prominence right here. 
here's another one over here where the corona is also showing you with the corona graph, I'm sorry, is showing you some things coming out from the chromosphere. And so here's a nice uh, summary of the sun's surface and upper layers. The photosphere, which is the layer that we see when we don't look at the sun. The chromosphere is a thin layer above it. Here's the layers where all the, where all the um, prominences and beautiful things are getting shot off and the corona extending millions of miles out. So are there any questions about that? Anything that we've talked about? Uh, yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, Excellent. Here we have one. How are sunspots formed? So sunspots are places where um, the sun has a magnetic field. And because it twists and turns, because it rotates in the center of the sun faster than it does at the poles, the equator versus the poles, um, these magnetic field lines get all twisted and tangled like a big knot. The sunspots are areas where the magnetic field lines come out of the sun and they bring particles in and out and that makes a cool spot. So the sunspot is a dark spot, even though it's thousands of degrees, it's slightly cooler than the surrounding area of the sun, so it looks dark. All right, and we have another question. Uh, will you do another astronomy presentation in May? I will do another one in May. Um, I'll probably, since, uh, um, I, again, I am a chemist, but because of the um, stay home, stay safe order, I am banished from my laboratory for at least another two weeks. So I'll probably start working on um, another astronomy night presentation fairly soon. I'd like it to be not at the end of May, but maybe more closer to the, to the middle or maybe about the 20th rather than this one at the 20th. But yes, I will do another one. And another one after that, if possible. Um, the only time that we have, that I may have to take off, I do these about once a month, but in um, the summer, June, July, and August, under normal circumstances, we have um, 50 to 100 uh, research interns here at the STEM Center, and that occupies my time enough that I end up having to take the, um, a uh, month or two off in the summer from astronomy nights. But during the school year, there's one a month. And that's all the questions for now. All right, so the last thing I have, we are almost done. The Parker Solar Probe, this was just launched a couple of years ago, not even two, not even two years ago, to study the sun's atmosphere and the solar wind. Um, it will actually travel so close to the sun that it will go through the atmosphere, through part of the corona. Um, it's going to use Venus flybys to actually slow its speed, kind of the opposite of what Voyager and the other um, probes do. It'll have two dozen orbits until its mission ends. It will be the fastest spacecraft ever. Here is the initial few orbits. So here's where it was launched. The outer orbit is the Earth's orbit. This is Venus's orbit. This is Mercury's orbit. And the dot in the center is the Sun. If you're paying close attention, you'll notice that Mercury is a little off center. That's not a bad drawing, that's accurate. Mercury has a higher ellipticity in its orbit. So here we are at Earth. Here's what the Parker probe has done. First time, first three times around in this orbit right here, where they got to about 15 million miles. The, the fourth orbit, which has just finished, I couldn't find an updated one, but it's coming, it's already come past here. They got under 12 million miles and they were going a quarter of a million miles per hour incredible speeds. The ultimate goal is almost half a million miles an hour to get in these red orbits where they are very, very close to the sun. And some brief results that we've already learned in these early preparatory um, orbits. First, again, that speed record, Voyager 1, which has left the solar system, is currently traveling at only 38,000 miles per hour. And at its peak near the sun, um, Parker reached 244,000 miles an hour. Amazing. One thing Parker has discovered is that the region near the sun has no cosmic dust. So there are no meteorites there. Um, basically, they're essentially vaporized by the intensity of the solar radiation there. 
it discovered some unexpected switchbacks in the solar magnetic field. That's what this drawing is supposed to illustrate. And you may have to adjust the angle of your laptop because this is kind of faint, but right here, you'll see a little bit of a Z in the field going out here. You'll see a little bit of a Z. This is not a photograph. This is a drawing of the kinks in the solar magnetic field. And this is one of the things that might be important in accelerating the solar wind out towards Earth and the rest of the solar system. So um, we're pretty much uh, at the end. Now it's time for homework. And as always, no telescope needed. Important, see Venus in the evening. It's the best show for Venus for years to come. Peak brilliance is tonight. Tomorrow night it'll be just as good. The next night it'll be just as good, but it'll be gone by the end of May. So don't wait. Catch Mercury low in the sky at the end of the month. The, at May 20th, it should be easy to see and it'll get better and better as, as time goes on. And here's one I'd like, wouldn't want you to miss. When Mercury and Venus are very close together in the sky on May 21st. Those are all in the evening. In the morning, see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars all lined up in the sky like a string of pearls. Absolutely beautiful. Venus will join them later in June, which will make it even more cool. And keep an eye out for that star called Betelgeuse. It's still dimmer than normal, and very soon it'll be gone into the sunset where you won't be able to observe it for another few months, and then it'll be in the morning sky. So if anyone, I normally, when we're in person, I give handouts, um, the star charts that I showed, and things like this, for example. I will hand these out, and here's the star chart that I believe you saw. If you want to have those handouts, I can email them to you. Send me an email at starked at msu.edu. If you want to be notified when future presentations are going to take place, because they take place randomly, um, because we do want to do observing when we're back in normal conditions. And if we happen to have them at the same time every month, we'll see the, the moon at the same phase every month. So we, they happen kind of randomly. Um, then send an email to the same address. Let me know whether you want the handout or the notification or both. Um, and with that, are there any final questions? Yep, so a couple have come in. Um, All right. So why does the probe need to be so fast to keep from falling into the sun gravity well, to keep cool? Um, the first answer, your first guess was correct. Um, because it is so close to the sun, do you remember Newton's, that Newton's equation? Because it is so close to the sun, the sun's gravity is tremendously strong. If it traveled any slower, it would be pulled into the sun. So if we had our choice, and if we wanted to examine the sun, we would just put a spacecraft there and park it. Well, it would be pulled into the sun like a shot. The only way it cannot be pulled into the sun is to be screaming at such incredible speeds. Now you will probably remember, if I can go back, that it's only in this portion that they're close to the sun, so it's only here that it's traveling very, very fast. Out here, it's traveling at a, almost the same speed that the Earth is, is traveling, which is fast enough, um, but it's nowhere near what it's doing here. So in each of these orbits basically lasts about roughly 90 days per orbit. But this part here is extremely fast, and this part here is just typical satellite speed. What was the other question? Yes, so there's a question. Uh, will Betel or Betelgeuse ever shine as bright as it used to? That's a great question. And I can tell you, nobody knows. And that's why I'm encouraging you to get out there and see it. Not because, okay, you're, lo you're going to look up, you'll see a star. All right. Um, it's not like it's any dramatically different than other stars. It's a very bright star. You can't miss it. All right. It's a first magnitude star, one of the top 10, top 20 stars in the sky in terms of brightness. But it's just what's so cool about it is that you can look at that star without a telescope and you can compare it to nearby stars with your own eye and you will get data at the same rate that professional astronomers are getting it because we don't know what's happening. This was, it was completely unexpected. Betelgeuse is a variable star. 
its brightness goes up and down a little bit. But ever since measurements were made back in all the way back to the um, late 1800s, this is the dimmest it has ever been. And like I say, it's unexpected. So that's just one thing that makes it cool. Or you can actually be on the forefront of science and can tell if Betelgeuse suddenly brightens up in the next few days, you'll know about it as soon, the same, before the press releases hit. So that's, that's why I'm encouraging it. It's just a star, but it's a special one. And we don't know if it's going to get brighter or not. Well, there are currently no questions in the queue. All right, so I'll stay here for another, um, it's about uh, 10, 10 minutes past our uh, one hour time. I'll stay here for another few minutes in case anyone wants to um, type in a few more questions. Um, all of you who have stayed with me this long, you are to be rewarded for your interest in astronomy. Thank you very much. And I hope to see all of you at the, or see, I would love to see all of you at the next astronomy night, but we probably, you probably, I probably won't see you, but I hope you will see me and maybe the astronomy night after that, you can all come over to the STEM Center and we can do this in person.